89 years and there's not enough room on the cake for all of the candles and there's not enough time to tell all the stories of 89 years. Welcome again to another in the series of Our Stories uh, that we're recording for the Cannon Falls History Museum as well as Channel 12. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have Marguerite Meg Judge with us today who has a colorful and interesting life with many chapters in it to tell. And I'd be remiss again not to thank our crack camera crew that's making this all look good, Dick Mensing and Mike Gesme for doing all the work to edit and film this. Well, I know that all of us have said we wish we had listened to our mothers and to our grandmothers and to have listened to the stories that they have. And I keep saying, why didn't I document that in the sake, for the sake of history. And the three fellows that are here right now doing this television thing for me are making capsules of history to put in the Cannon Falls Museum of people here in Cannon Falls. And so, of course, I had to put my money where my mouth was and sit down here and practice what I preach and tell my life story. So I will start with my story in Goodhue. I have a wonderful memory of my father who had a restaurant, and my father was the kindest man I have ever met. There were two men in town who had cerebral palsy, and they were not able to go into other places, eating places, because it was unappetizing to watch how they were eating and how they were unable to eat without drooling and spilling food all over. And my dad allowed them to come in and they went to that back booth. And dad fixed their dinner, cut it up nicely for them, and then he sat down and visited with them while they ate their dinner. That was a kind man. And my mother, I remember, ironing 17 shirts at night. I counted them one night because Dad had to have white shirts and so did everyone who worked in the restaurant. She loved to sew and I remember her singing. She had the gift of music. She had an operatic voice that was beautiful and she was in many operettas where she lived, but at 27 she lost her hearing and then she stopped singing except when she was sewing. And I remember she said the most fun she could have in life was to try to make a dress out of a half a yard material too little. And in the depression she made lots of dresses for little girls. She made over any piece of material she could find she made into dresses. She made all of my clothes. I had a brother and I had a sister. And my sister said that I kept her awake every single night telling stories, that I made up stories about her and about me and adventures that we would take all over the world and finally she would fall asleep and I would still be talking. And my brother is a man of few. No, that is a mistake. He is a man of many words. He is a master of adjectives and adverbs. And Marguerite, tell us for the sake of the viewers your family's name and if it, their family name that you grew up with and where your parents came from originally. Okay, my dad was a Norwegian Lutheran. His name was Henry Swenson. My mother was Regina Honora Kelly. That means the Honorable Queen. Regina Honora is Latin for that. We always called her the Honorable Queen. She hated it. Um, my sister's name is Eunice, my brother's name is David. My sister lives in Michigan, my brother lives in Ohio. Maybe you can pick up the story as you were growing up in Goodhue, Meg. Well, I had a best friend and her name was Lori. And so what I will do is take you on a little jaunt on a Saturday morning with Lori and I up and down the streets of Goodhue. 
We would go down on Saturday morning and try to catch a ride in the sleigh because the farmers would come in with their horses and their sleighs. And the fun for the day would be to get a ride. They would stop and let us get on and we would ride through the streets of Goodyear on the sleighs. When we jumped off, our first order of stop was to go to the outhouse that was down on Main Street in Goodhue because Sidney, the shoemaker, would go in there and there was always a lock on the outside of the door to keep the door from blowing open in the wintertime and the snow to get all over the Montgomery Ward catalog that was in there. And so we would go down there and sure enough, Sidney would be in there and we'd lock him in. And then we would run and hide. And pretty soon he would holler very loudly and the undertaker across the road would always hear him and come over and let him out. So we would leave Sydney and we would go over to the dray line where we would pick out all the horses that we thought were the best. And we were there long enough for the master of the dray line to come over and hand us a pitchfork and tell us we could help and then we disappeared. And we would go down to the man who had the um, camera shop and took all of the pictures. And we would go in there because we always interrupted his schedule. And we would go in there and he would say, you are interrupting my schedule. And we would burst into laughter and run out the door holding our hands over our mouth, laughing at his mispronunciation. And we went from Sydney over to the grocery store. And remember, this was Depression days. And he said a, a sign up there that said, all this for 10 cents. And they were the blackest bananas. They were more than ready for banana bread. We left and went to the meat market where the two Haney brothers kept a meat market and one of them would say, have your money ready, little girly, don't delay the game. And then they would give us a couple of sausages and we would run on. But there were some of them who didn't give us a handout. Well, we went to the pharmacy and we would tease the poor dear pharmacist that was there who lived in the back we would ask him when he was going to marry the lady who fixed lunch for him every day. <clears throat> and then we would go upstairs over the pharmacy where Lori lived and we would put on our roller skates and ride up and down on our roller skates on the wooden floors. We had to stop when Dr. Liffrey came. He had his office on the other side of the upstairs and if he was taking blood pressures, we could not be roller skating in the hall. And Lori's sister would always be cleaning the steps down and berating us for not helping. We would manage to run, stick our tongue out at her and run. And then we would go through the stuff that Dr. Liffrig had up in his office. We were fascinated. And he allowed us to see everything that was in there. And he encouraged us to learn. He taught us a lot and we thought he was wonderful. We wanted to grow up to be nurses and help Dr. Liffrig. There were other little places. We went to the one man who always paid us 25 cents for a poppy when we sold poppies. Everybody else just gave us a nickel or a penny. But one man gave us 25 cents and he was very crabby and everyone was afraid of him. But we went to him anyway because he gave us 25 cents, which in those days was a lot of money. Now, <clears throat> after living in Goodyear and Lori and I growing up together, we went through 12 years of schooling in Goodyear. And then we went to nurses training together. In those days, there were three things available for girls. You could be a secretary, you could go into teaching, or you could go into nursing. And we decided nursing. 
So away we went with $35 in our hand because that's what we had to pay for our uh, uniforms and our books was $35. And we went into that great big stone house behind the hospital where the nurses lived and it was very drab, and my mother looked at it just horrified. Lori and I didn't care at all. We were so excited and so happy, but my mother promptly went home, got a couple of orange crates, made us little dressers, and put chintz around it, and made us uh, curtains and bedspreads, and we had the best-looking room in the nurse's dorm. And where, where was this, Meg? <coughs> this is in Red Wing at St. John's. Mm -hmm. And everybody else was wiping their tears away. They were sad to leave home, not Lori and I. We were so happy to be off on another adventure in our life. And I will never forget how we worked very hard, from sometimes from 7 in the evening till 7 in the morning. And we would have like a half a day off. One time I forgot that I gave somebody the bedpan and didn't put it on the chart. And I lost my half day, and never again did I ever forget to chart that. But <clears throat> Lori <coughs> was a good note taker. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, after we had worked all night, we had bacteriology class. And I remember falling asleep, of course, and Lori was taking notes. And afterwards, I said, Lori, can I see your notes? And she said, sure. <laughs> she had written. Bacteria are best when one is sleeping. <laughs> Brilliant, Lori. <clears throat> Over 70 years of nursing, we have seen so many changes in the medical field. And um, I think that probably the biggest change is that there's so much technology. And machines tell you what's the matter with the, your patient where well, we had to use our five senses and become very observant to see what was the matter with our patients. But I, we've said we could never go back now because we can't take care of the machines very well. We did just fine with the people. But there's just too many things to learn now. Um, Pro probably for the Cannon Falls viewers, Meg, you should reveal who this mysterious Lori is that spent so much of your youth with you. She's Laurie O'Gorman and she's right here at Twin Rivers with me now. And the thing about us now is we have wonderful long-term memories and our short-term memories aren't that great anymore. But <clears throat> we went through all those years together and here we are still good friends. Um, I did pack to go home once I was having a pity party for myself one day. We had to make all of our own bandages in those days, and I was back in the bandage room pulling gauze and sniffing away. And in came an older nurse, and um, she said, what's the matter, Marguerite? And I said, well, I have a cousin. She works up in South St. Paul, and she makes sausages. And she's got money, and I don't, and I'm not going to have any money for three years in nurse training. And she looked at me, and she said, well, I'm a graduate nurse and I make a lot more money than those people who make sausages. You just stick around, but any nurse that doesn't pack her bag at least three times and try to go home isn't worth her salt. So I stayed. And I forgot to tell you that when I was growing up in Goodhue, I went to my mother one day and I said, I'm going to start to smoke now, mother. And she said, fine go over to the humidor, there's a package of Chesterfields there. And she said, but it's just like olives. You have to eat at least three, and you have to keep on eating a lot of them before you get to like them. So if you smoke a cigarette, you have to smoke three. Okay. So I met my brother on the way to the bathroom, and he said, Maggie, how come you look so green? <laughs> so that ended my smoking. But that day in nurses' training, I thought, well, I'm older now. I think I'll go up to Fred's, which was the little confectionery up above the hospital, and get a package of Philip Morris, and I'll try smoking again. I threw up again, 
and that ended my smoking. I've never smoked since. My mother was very wise. wise. So how long was the nurse's training and what happened next? Nurse's training was three years. And um, there were some things that did happen in nurse's training that made me think about something else. I was asked one night to give a, a medication to a 16-year-old girl who was pregnant. And I could understand that she didn't want to be pregnant, and I felt really bad for her. But I knew, too, that if I gave that medication, if I didn't give it and the doctor had ordered it, I would be kicked out of training. And if I did give it, I knew that I would be directly responsible for ending a life. And I thought, you know, I can't do this. So I called the supervisor and I said, I can't do this. And she said to me, you shouldn't have to. Go back to work, I'll take care of it. There is a God. But I knew then that maybe I should see that I never got into a predicament like that again, that I should work where I would never have to, where rules were different. And I was leaning just a little bit toward St. Mary's and going there. And I remembered uh, when I was younger, a sister, Timothea, came to teach us summer school. And I was around her. I liked her very much, and I had my bicycle, and she said, can I ride your bike? I said, sure. And she tore her habit. I said, oh, are you going to get it? And she laughed, and I thought, I really like her. She can laugh at herself. I kind of like to be somebody like that. And I was leaning toward the Franciscans, who were nurses, in Rochester. And one day I was given a patient who no one else wanted to take care of. The patient was dirty, smelled bad. No one wanted to go in that room. And I thought, well, this is it. This is where you separate the sheep from the goats. If I can't go in there and do that, I can't be a nurse. And then I thought about St. Francis of Assisi who took care of the lepers. And he said he could look at the lepers and see the broken body of Christ. And I knew that if I could look at any patient and see the broken body of Christ, that I could use my healing touch and give tender loving care to anybody. It worked for me every time. Okay, I decided to enter the convent and I was there for eight years. And I really value that part of my life. I was able to be there for eight years and have the contemplative life in the beginning where you focus on the journey of the soul to God and where you focus on ancient history and uh, the life of Christ. And after three years of contemplative life, then I went into the active missionary life and I worked with Dr. Mayo. And I worked at St. Mary's Hospital and I was head nurse in his operating room. So did you need extra special training to be the head surgical nurse? So that sounds like a high esteem position for someone with three years of nurses training. We learned on the job, <clears throat> and I had some weeks with some of the greats that <clears throat> some of the sisters who had worked there for years. And I had a stomach ache the whole time because you can't make a mistake in the operating room, and you really have to know what you're doing. You have to know the suture, you have to know the right instrument. I read, I studied, and I worked hard. And I was, Dr. Mayo had the, another operating room and then I had the second operating room. 
and the nurse in the first operating room helped me a lot. And I had students. And the students, when they were in the operating room, there was a coveted award for the best student in uh, operating room. It was 300 bucks, and that was a lot for a student in those days. And three of my students got those, that scholarship. One of the girls was from Cannon Falls, I remember. And what we did so that they were good in the operating room is that I taught them everything that I knew after the day was done. They stayed and we played operation and we went through all of the layers, the skin, the fascia, the fat, what kind of sutures would we use, what kind of instrument would you put in his hand right away. And working with Dr. Mayo, he was very fast. He didn't want his patients to be under anesthesia for one second more than they had to be. And we had to be ready, and we had to be ready on time. And <clears throat> I guess I never told anyone how unhappy I was that in the operating room, all you do is take care of dirty instruments. You don't take care of patients. But I did the best I could. And I remember a couple of days that were the worst days in my life. One of them, at night we would go down and we would see the list for the next day. And I had a patient in my room listed for what's called a Mechowitz. A Mechowitz is a repair of the perineal body. And if a woman had a Mechowitz done, the doctor didn't want a pregnancy to ruin what he had done. So the tubes had to be tied. And whenever there was a Mechowitz on the list, the supervisor would come and say, it is your responsibility to tell Dr. Mayo that he may not tie the tubes because this is a institution where we do not do sterilization and we do not do abortions. Well, I cried all night and I didn't sleep all night. I thought, how am I going to tell Dr. Mayo what he can do and what he can't do? Who do I think I am that I can do that? I can't do that. And the morning came and I was so tired and they wheeled the patient in. <laughs> it was a man. Because <laughs> men get mechowitzes too. I told Dr. Mayo and he, he and I both laughed all morning. <clears throat> he was such a great man. One time when I had a, a floor and I was, wasn't in surgery anymore, a couple nights after night prayer I'd go back if there were a couple of patients that I worried about. And one night we had this one patient who simply wouldn't eat anything. And at night I went back and here were Dr. Mayo with a thermos of homemade soup. And he said to the patient, I made this for you, now you eat it. Mm. And he did. Oh, I impressive. knew then I was in the presence yep. of greatness. Was, was Dr. Mayo a specialist or did he do any kind of surgery that came along? He did mostly general surgery. He did a lot of thyroid surgery and he did uh, uh, abdominal surgery a lot. That was, mo it was mostly general surgery. We hated it when we, we had general surgery rooms. Sometimes neurosurgery would be too uh, full and we'd get a neurosurgeon and Sister Paula and I would look at each other and say, move over God, here comes a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they were, you know, a cut above. You were the neurosurgeon, you were full of yourself. But Dr. Mayo doesn't sound like he had any of that. No. Attitude. No, not at all. And one another night I went back, we had this patient who had hiccups, and he had them for day and night, for day after day, and no matter what we did, nothing stopped. And here comes Dr. Mayo with another doctor in tow. And whoops, he didn't expect to see me there, and he said, Sister, don't tell. I said, okay, what is it? This man is a chiropractor and he does not have a license to work here at St. Mary's Hospital. But the man's had hiccups and I don't know what to do and he does. So this 
chiropractor, wonderful doctor, went in and pushed something in the patient's neck, and the hiccup stopped. And I thought, good. And then Dr. Mayo just winked at me and said, you know, you got to give the devil his due, sister, and you're not to tell. And I never told until now. <laughs> There's nobody can get me now. <laughs> <clears throat> and Dr. Mayo had a very healthy vocabulary. I mean, he could really swear, I guess, in other rooms. He never swore in my room. And one day I thanked him for that. And he said, well, I didn't dare. I figured you'd cry. And I thought, wouldn't Lori laugh at that? She and I, who grew up on the streets of Goodyear, we heard every word there was. <laughs> and one of the the second assistant said to me, well, we get really angry in surgery when things don't go right. What can we do? And I said very piously, you can use discipline. A few days later, this same doctor's wife gave me a call and said, I got to tell you this, sister. He pounded his thumb, put, fixing the screen door on the porch, and he's dancing around on the porch, hollering, discipline, discipline, <laughs> discipline. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have a, a couple more stories to tell. I have to tell you about Sidney. Sidney, the little man who fixed the shoes in Goodyear. Sidney came to my operating room and Dr. Mayo operated on him. And I had to take the tumor from his colon and send it to the lab and it came back cancer. I felt so much remorse for over the years for having deviled him so much. But <clears throat> I did go to visit him afterwards and I was sitting there in my white habit and my hands folded and the silence in the room was pretty, <laughs> pretty big. And then all of a sudden Sidney giggled and said, Oh, you ain't always been so good. <laughs> <laughs> and then he looked and he said, look it, I got flowers. The only person in Goodyear that sent me flowers was the undertaker. <laughs> and we laughed. People kept peeking in to see what this old man and this nun were laughing so hard about. But that's not the last that you will hear of Sydney in my stories. There's still more to come on Sydney. One time I had a man as a patient from the South and he raised pecans and I'm very fond of pecans. And so I said to one of my friends, that man has pecan trees. And she said, I never heard of that disease. What is <laughs> pecan trees? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> I also had an army major and he was a medical doctor and he was a major in the army and he came to St. Mary's for just a, a, a maybe a couple months of surgery and he had to be the second assistant. Well, he didn't think he had to do the stuff the second assistant usually did, like mop the floor, because he was an MD and he was a major and he found out very soon that in an operating room, if everyone doesn't do what the teamwork says, everyone has a specific chore to do. If everyone doesn't do their work, it doesn't get done on time. So he had to swallow hard and do what I said. Those are, are wonderful stories, but obviously you didn't stay in Rochester and you didn't stay in the convent because you're here today. What happened next? It took a lot of courage to leave the religious life. Um, it's different now, but in those days, it was just not done. It would have been easier, I think, to stay than to find the courage to go, but I had support from home. My mother said, if you don't belong there, then you should come home. There's no shame in you coming home. There'd be shame if you stayed and you aren't supposed to be there. And my dad said, you don't take a champion racehorse and make a workhorse out of 
them. He knew that I had worked so hard and such long hours, <clears throat> especially during corn picking season. I was on call every night and people would come to St. Mary's from all over for emergency surgery and we worked day and night. I didn't have a day off all summer long and it took its toll on my health. And so I decided I won't lose the dream. I'll just change my dream. I'll figure out what it is God wants me to do with the rest of my life and try not to miss the clues. So I came home. And of course, Lori was right there. Lori and Bob thought I should get back in the world. And so they were searching for somebody for a date for me. I said, I'm not going on a date. Well, it was New Year's Eve and they said, you are coming with me. We won't have a date, liars that they were. I got in that car and of course I was sitting there with my hat and my gloves on for a New Year's Eve party at Red Wing. And in this car comes Jerome. <clears throat> And he, they had told him some wild story, like we have this wallflower, this ugly dog that you have to take to the dance. And when he got in the car, he was very surprised that I didn't have two heads and warts all over my face. But he was wonderful that night, and we went to this party, and he wondered, where in the world have I seen her before? Oh, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, he saw this look of horror on my face. One of the nurses had passed out from drinking too much. And it dawned on him who I was. And he said, oh, ha, huh, you wish you were back? <laughs> and then we went over and had some lutefisk. And one of the nurses had a plate full of lutefisk. She didn't know I had left the convent. And when she saw me standing there, she said, oh, now I know I'm drunk. And all of her lutefisk went on the floor. <laughs> and I was overwhelmed with the coming back into the world. But Jerome said, if you want to go home, I'll take you home. And from that day on, he was there for me all the time. He was so kind and so gentle. And Lori had plans for me, but I wasn't ready. I went home and Dr. Mayo called. He found out what my name was and where I lived. And he said, I want you to come in here and I want to know what you want to do. And um, he said, I will write a recommendation for you any place in the world and I will tell them you are the best damn nurse in the world for the, with the possible exception of my mother. And he, I said, well, you know, maybe I'd like to go to the university. If I'm going to make my way in the world, I have to earn some money and make a life for myself. He went to the phone and he called up Catherine Densford in charge of all the nurses at the university. And I was instantly admitted to the university. And they had a, a plan where you could work two days a week and live in the nurse's dorm up there and get your room and board paid. And you could earn tuition money by doing private duty nursing. And I did that for two years. When I was up there one day, I was working in the heart hospital, and Dr. Varco, who was an outstanding heart surgery at the time, saw me taking care of a child in heart hospital, and he said, who are you, and how is it that you know exactly what to do? So I told him just a little bit. And he said, come and work for me in the operating room. And I looked at him and I said, thank you, but no, I prefer taking care of people and not instruments. 
And it felt so good to be free to speak up for myself at that time. And in the heart hospital, the very first day that I went to work, the head nurse that was there was a girl who had been a student of mine. And be always be good to your students because you never know when they're going to be your boss. But that day, there was a child who died, and everyone was devastated. And the head nurse came over to me, and I wasn't a sister anymore, but she said, Sister, he died. And she cried, and I held her, and I comforted her. And I realized at the end of that day that I was the same person, I'm the same nurse, in and out of the habit. And um, that was an aha moment for me in my life. So you spent two years then at the University of Minnesota. Yes. <clears throat> and when I finally graduated, then I was ready to come back to Cannon Falls and be married. And then I had two children, three children, and six grandchildren and two and a half great-grandchildren. And living with a man who made me laugh every day of my life, I couldn't help but be happy. I had the good fortune to know Jerome pretty well, and he did make a person laugh almost all the time. So he was a great guy. And he was from Cannon Falls. That's, that's how you ended up back in Cannon Falls then, okay. And when I, <clears throat> when I did come back, I got a job right away back in Red Wing. But one day, Dr. Molinar came in there and he said, well, we're building a new hospital in Cannon Falls. You belong there. End of conversation. I thought, well, I'll try it. And Maris, Miss Mary Vesta Sowers, who is legendary for her controlling way of doing things, hired me and, oh, she was a tyrant. You had to do everything her way, and the working there was just intolerable. And I will never forget Dr. Moliner one day. He was so mad at her that he cussed all the way out to his car. <laughs> but finally, Mary Vetch Sowers left Cannon Falls. And then my dream job opened up. Now, man and his wife who had a little boy with cystic fibrosis. I had taken care of the little boy at the university and I liked him so much I had him for my case study. And the, uh, the father was on the school board and the little boy with cystic fibrosis wanted to be in school but he got sent home every day what he needed was nursing intervention every day so that he could continue to stay in school. And so it all fell into place. And I went to the school and established the school nursing program there. And people th didn't understand how a public health nurse could be helpful in the school situation. And I had many administrators who didn't understand. You know, I had so many good people that I worked with. And I had administrators who were willing to see what the scope of nursing and seeing to the health needs of children, what a good idea it was. Actually, I documented in my thesis over 200 different health conditions that I intervened with with children over the 24 years that I was there. And I just had wonderful secretaries, Muriel and Marge and Elaine, and I had cooks and bus drivers and custodians who gave me so many referrals of the boys and girls. And of course, I could never have gotten through without Lola and June, who came for 24 years and helped me do vision and screening as volunteers. 
the help that I received from everyone. To, and the churches helped. There were so many heartwarming stories. I'll never forget one man coming up to me one night and saying, I meant to thank you a long time ago, but when I was in the sixth grade, you gave me the only new coat I ever had. And then there was a little girl in the second grade who saw that I, had, I was too busy to get my bulletin board done for Christmas. It was nothing on my bulletin board. And she said, oh, make you your bulletin board, Mrs. Judge. She went back and she cut out a little yellow star and brought it back to me and I put it on my bulletin board and I left just that up there. To me, that was more than any other bulletin board I could have put up there. That little girl made that for me. It's fascinating to me. I didn't realize that there wasn't a school nursing component. You, you, you set that up in Cannon Falls. There wasn't such a thing before you started it. That's right. Yeah, and now it's such a part of every school system that... After I left, I got four. Yeah. Well, and as I kind of remember, you were nurse, social worker, kind of everything wrapped into one. You did a, had, wore a lot of hats in that job. I did, and there were four schools at the time. And the secretaries just had to keep following me to be sure that they knew what school I was in when. Um, I uh, have a couple other stories, too. One of them is a little girl who, one of the other little boys would pick on her all the time. She had to stop once in a while. She couldn't, when she was in line, she didn't go fast like she was supposed to when he would step on her heels. And she would be in there crying. And I said, well, did you ever kick him back or hit him back or do something? No, I never did. And I said, well, I would. And of course, that was forbidden. I should never have said that, but I did. And the next day, she and the boy both were sitting in the principal's office, and she looked up at me, and she winked at me. <laughs> I said, yes. I did make one awful mistake, and I never made it again. I said to the little boy who needed to go home, can I call your dad? I ain't got none. I never made that mistake again. Well, I did go back. The school nurses invited me back on school nurses day, and you just never get done being a nurse. Um, I would love to go back right now and you know just roll up my sleeves and get in there. And the girls that are there do such a good job. Oh, they, and I saw how easy it was for them and how many things they have on the computerized now. And, but there are so many boys and girls who have asthma, who have, you know, disabling conditions. And they're very busy right now. But one of the things, one of the, I wasted a lot of time always trying to justify my position. I had to tell everybody it was more than Band-Aids because nobody knew how much you could do as a nurse in the school. But I had to deal a lot with children with, with death. And... Um, Actually, I did go down to St. Louis, to the University of St. Louis, and give a workshop on dealing uh, with death with children because um, the group that I taught were uh, counselors and, you know, ministers and hospital people. They knew a lot about dealing with death with adults, but they didn't understand how someone who's three, who's five, who's eight, who's 13, all have different perceptions of death, and they have to be treated differently. And uh, I do have one thing that I thought maybe you should, I should read to you. Of a little girl in the second grade who came in my office because her grandpa had died. And she was crying, and she said, 
Mrs. Judge, I have so many tears and I don't know what to do with them. What can I do with them? And I said, well, I have this nice chair or you can sit in my lap or you can be on the, the cot. Or I have an idea. You could write a letter to Grandpa. I have color crayons and colored paper and you could put all the words down that you wanted to ask him or that you wanted to tell him. And she said, it was a good idea, but how am I going to get it to him? I said, we're going to put it in an envelope and we're going to slip it in the casket and he's going to read it when he gets there. And this is her letter. Dear Grandpa, I am sorry you had to die like this. I had tears in my eyes. I hope you are happy. I am wondering what is happening up in heaven. I am wondering if baby God is smiling at me. What is Mary doing? Is it fun up there? Would you like me to put a flower on your grave? Can you hear my prayer? Does heaven have things that we have, like TVs and radio and pop? I always wondered if God drank pop. Mm -hmm. I will pray to you tonight. I know they are Father and Hail Mary and a lot of others. I love you. P.S. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. And this is a letter that I put in with her for her to take home to her parents. This is a copy of your love letter to Grandpa for you to keep forever. Now that he died and went to heaven, your Grandpa's love for you is like God's love for you. It will always be there. You can reach that love by saying good prayers that you make up yourself. When good persons die and go to God, there is great joy in heaven, and it's a happy place to be. Maybe it doesn't seem like it, because some people here are crying and they're sad. And that's because they will miss being around your grandpa the way he was when he was here on earth. People have to cry their tears away. We have to let them cry because it helps them get rid of the lonely feeling and the stomach ache. The best thing that we can do to help is to give hugs and hold hands. We all have turns being sad and wishing that we knew all of the answers to the why question. It really helps to remember that dying isn't just the end of things, but that it's the beginning of a new good place. My house was filled with music because my children received the gift of music that Grandma had and I had missed me. But I always said it took somebody to take them to music lessons. It took somebody to sit through the endless recitals. That was my job. But a um, Native American shaman came by our house after we left and sold it to and the people that we sold it to. And the shaman went in there and said, this house is filled with music. Was there someone who played the music, played music in this house? And the lady said, oh yes, there was. And I thought, you know, the, the energy there was good. And when you're in the country, Somebody said to me, how come you had two musicians? And I said, it's because I never said the word practice. It was their own responsibility to practice and to learn their lesson. And I never had to say practice. And I couldn't help them with it because I'm not a musician. And um, I have one daughter who is a public health nurse like I am. And she is the one who appreciates music the most. She's the one that has the tickets to the opera. And then <clears throat> I have these wonderful grandchildren. You know, Jeff adopted two little boys from Bogota, from Colombia. And um, when Grandpa Jerome was dying, Nicholas came and said, I don't want my grandpa to die. And I said, Nicholas, you got to go down in the basement where grandpa's eating popcorn and watching TV, and you got to tell him about it. So he went down, thump, 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 and 
went over to Jerome and said, Grandpa, I'm real sorry that you're dying of cancer. And of course, Jerome wanted to just laugh out loud, but he said, well, Nicholas, I'm okay with it. I'm so lucky because I know what I'm going to die from, and I tried all my life to be a good boy, and so now I'm ready to go to heaven. And I'm okay with it. And so you don't have to, you know, feel bad about it at all. And so Nicholas was okay with it. But the next one, Danny, <coughs> said, I'm quitting school. My dad said, no, you're not. Well, no, I'm not, not letting Grandma live here alone. If Grandma lives here alone, she'll be scared. And so I'm going to quit school and live here with Grandma, take care of her. And <laughs> Jeff said, Mother, you've got to take care of this yourself. So I said, well, Danny, you know, it says someplace in the Bible or someplace that if you want something, you pray, and God will send ministering angels to help you. And, you know, there are ministering angels all around my house, and I'm not afraid to stay here. So you can go to school okay. And believe me, I had many neighbors who were ministering angels. Danny got out the door and then he poked his little head back in and said, but Grandma, be sure you lock all the doors, will you? <laughs> <laughs> and now I have two great-grandchildren. Well, I mean, one and a half. As we speak, the second one is about to be born. <clears throat> I remember getting a phone call down in uh, New Mexico when I was down there with storytelling. And uh, they came up from downstairs and said, you have an emergency phone call. And I said, oh, who died? Said, Nobody died. Somebody's very excited. It was Jillian, my first oldest granddaughter, and she, they, she was part of the baseball team. And they booed because she was the only girl and they didn't want to have a girl on the team. Okay, she was mad because they booed. And then it was the ninth inning and they were behind and they just had this one time and she was the last batter up and she hit a home run. <laughs> and she redeemed women all over the world for wanting to play basketball. And uh, I said, Jillian, you tell your mother, everybody on the place gets snicker bars. Grandma will pay for them. <laughs> and Meredith is the one, and I have just a wonderful story of Meredith, of how she made friends with the flowers. Because Meredith was an only child. And when you're an only child, you have to have friends. And so she had wonderful stories that she made up. All the flowers had names. And Riley, well, Riley went to the army for a while. And of course, I got wonderful letters from Riley. And Riley got wonderful letters from me. But I couldn't send them cookies. There was a rule. What kind of dumb rule is that for the United States government to have that grandmothers cannot sell, send cookies to their grandson? It's really a dumb one. We moved here um, two weeks before Jerome died. And that was traumatic. You got to get rid of your stuff. Yep. You got to get over your stuff because you have to downsize everything. And when Jerome got here, he was so relieved. He knew that I was in a good place. I'd be taken care of. And so those last two weeks, they're wonderful for people to have because you say the things that you need to say at the end. And I remember him saying time after time, I was so thankful to God that I married you and that you are with me on this last lap of the journey. And it is a wonderful time 
to say the things that you really need to say. And Jerome had a good friend that he went shopping with all the time, Norris. And Norris's wife, Anna, died about the same time that Jerome died. And Norris moved here. And for the first year that I was here, I had a lot of health issues. And I had pain that was awful. And nobody could do anything for me. I wouldn't take uh, drugs. I don't want drugs in my body. So I went to Dr. Fletcher, who gave me acupuncture. And finally, the pain left my body. And Dr. Fletcher gave me my life back again. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. And thank you, uh, Barbie Beckstead, who was my massage lady. And thank you, uh, Barbie, who, when I lost my hair and was losing it, she knew what to do to fix it. But <clears throat> um, Norris was here, and one day he recognized my pain. And he said, oh, you are having a lot of pain. And all of a sudden, I just let go. And I fell in those great big Swedish arms of his. And he chuckled, and he put my head back. And he said, and I am going to kiss the beautiful Mrs. Judge. And from that day on, he was no longer alone, and I was no longer alone. And what we managed to do now is take a little jaunt every week up to the final resting place of Jerome and Anna. And Nora sings in the sweet by and by to Anna. And I check to see that the red, white, and blue flag is flying over my hero, my leprechaun's grave. And then we go hand in hand and come back to Twin Rivers to the castle. And before I stop and give you three guys some cake, I am going to read you the blessing of the grandmother. One day a group of storytellers was down in New Mexico and the Native American storyteller looked around and said, Marguerite, you are the elder in the room, so it's up to you to give the blessing of the grandmothers. And so I do, and this is my blessing. I bless you in the name of all of those who have gone before us. I call upon the wisdom, the courage, the love, and the laughter of the grandmothers, the great-grandmothers, and the great-greats to sustain you on your journey. If you have listened, you have been taught by them what you need to know. From the loving arms of the Creator, all of the ancient ones watch and listen as we tell stories, we forge streams, we climb mountains, we stumble, we complain, we follow the stars, we catch rainbows, if we could but peek behind the clouds, we would see the rare smiles that reach the eyes of all the grandmothers as they bless us. Amen. Thank you so much, Meg. And before we eat cake, I think it'd be remiss if you didn't tell us a little bit about the storytelling and the characters you're playing now, because you're not sitting here idly watching TV as we come in. You seem to be out out and about playing all kinds of different people in life. Well, as I come home, there is a little character. If you go down and look at the mural downtown of that lady coming down in the canoe on the Cannon River alongside the mill, her name is Miss Millicent, and she was born in the storyteller part of my brain when I was asked to tell stories at the edge of the mural. And Miss Millicent has a wonderful costume made by Sylvia over in Northfield, my friend who was part of uh, 
Mass Theater in Rochester, and Millicent came from the old country, <clears throat> and she came over here to Ellis Island and across in the United States, and she looked for the mills. And the reason she looked for the mills was she knew that that would be the place where all of the roads come from the farmers, bring their grain to the mill, and that's where the people would be, and that's where the little store would be. And so Miss Millicent came down the Cannon River by the falls, and she thought, Cannon Falls, now wouldn't that be a nice place to live? And so she came here and made her home in Cannon Falls. And now in a few weeks, she's going to take a trip out to White Rock and meet Jesse James. And she keeps nudging me. She's always got more stories for me to write. I have to live another 89 years just to do all the things that Ms. Billison wants me to do. Thank you so much, Meg.